What I'd like to do this evening is to give you an overview of what, what I do in town halls and then we opened up for questions. So basically, what I want to talk to you about is four topics. One is the minimum wage increases coming up on the ballot in November. Two is the 3% surcharge that is being that, the, that a referendum wants to put on successful people in the state of Maine. Three, I want to talk to you about our tax structure in the state. And four, I would like to talk to you about our energy structure in the state. First, the folks in Augusta. The people in Augusta I like the slated just one of quite frankly. Uh, they don't really look at the facts, they look at their ideology. And one of the things that this state has, has gone through is a loss of jobs. While we have an unemployment rate, the lowest in the country, we have lost 6,000 high paid paper making jobs in our state. They continue to leave. And there's nothing that I can do or anybody can do unless we, the people, tell the people we elect that we do not want to be anti-business. And being anti-business is creating a couple of dilemmas. One is the only companies that want to come to Maine are companies like call centers. They come in one day and they go on the next. They're not willing to spend large amounts of investment to put infrastructure into the ground so they're here for 40, 50, 60 years. In the last few years, we've had a major investment in Woodland, Maine for two new tissue machines. It's about $250 million. That's the kind of investment that we need to be making in our state. Once all the paper companies are gone, and a couple more will be leaving this year, make no bones about it, because there are two factors that are really hurting. One is the structure of our tax system, and secondly, our energy costs. People say, well, LePage hates wind, LePage hates solar. No, I don't. What I hate is very simply this above market contracts. We are paying right now 14 cents. We're the 12th highest energy state in America. And we are signing contracts, I just vetoed a bill today, a solar bill, that will bring us up to 22 cents. If you're in Montreal, you spend about $35 a month for your electricity bill. In Maine, it's about $85. It'll be $100 when this bill goes up, if this bill, if this solar bill passed. Now, what happens in Montreal is you can heat your home and your electricity bill in December, January, and February with the electricity, pay about $100. That's how far out of whack we are with the rest of the country. I spoke to uh, the Council General of Taiwan a couple of weeks ago. We've been talking to him since January. We've been trying to get him in Maine to buy the paper mill in Old Town. He was in my office five minutes thanking me for all the meetings we've had and being so gracious and all this. But he said, we hired someone to look at the entire country and look at the economy in all 50 states and to tell us where the best invest investments are. And while you're the number two paper producer in America, Wisconsin's electricity is 30% less than yours, and they're number one. So we're not going to come to Maine, we're going to Wisconsin. Madison Paper Company, which is a world global conglomerate, is leaving.
leaving me. They're not leaving the United States and they're not going out of business. They're just leaving me. They're leaving me because I would cost number one in the country. Our energy is way out of line. Our taxation, both at the state level and at the property tax level, at local uh, taxes, are so high they cannot be profitable. They have six other plants in the U.S. and we are the most expensive. So they get now. Barber Foods out of Portland. They were sold. And within a month of their being sold, half the business went to Oklahoma. That company has recently filed what is called an SEC with the federal government, which means they're, th they're going to go public. And they have to make all disclosures of all their businesses. And they said that Maine's vulnerable because of our energy costs. So when you hear me speak of energy, I know what I'm talking about. Now, you may not agree with me, and that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to tell you what is causing us to be anti-business. Energy is one of them. The Taiwanese people said we are the 19th highest state in America to do business. They're going to Wisconsin because they're in the, I think it said 31. I'm not sure if it's 31 or 33, but they're not in the top half. They're less than the top half. People don't look at every state. When they look for a place to go, they look at the top 10 lowest. It's that simple. The other thing I do is I look at Let's look at the most prosperous states in America. And let's see what causes them to be prosperous. So let me give you a couple. Florida, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, Washington, Wyoming, Alaska. What do you think they all have in common? No way to and some don't even have a sales tax. Then they will tell you, well, look at New Hampshire. They don't have an income tax or a sales tax, but look at their property taxes. Guess what? Look at their property taxes. <laughs> Please do. And then compare them to yours. I have a house in Florida and a house in Maine. In Florida, in fact, we paid about the same thing for both houses. If you know, so if you're in the newspapers, you know what I paid for in Maine. My taxes in Maine are four thousand dollars. My taxes in Florida are eighteen hundred dollars. By the way, Florida doesn't have an income tax. So that's a real critical issue. Another major issue that the paper companies tell me is a problem is property taxes. I'll give you an example. Bucksport Maine closed last year. That mill sold $59 million to have it taken down, dismantled. They refused $62 million to keep it running. That was a business decision. In my mind, Maybe a good business decision for Verso, but a really bad decision for the people of the state of Maine. But a couple of things happen that I do agree with them on. That mill could have sold between $59 million and $62 million, but you know what they were paying taxes on? The last, their last assessment was $700 million is what they were paying taxes on. Millinocket, it shut down in 2008. I became governor in 2011. And they had not made any paper for three years. The doors were shut, locked, closed. They were still assessing the owners by $184 million. Now, after three years, they had made no adjustment and they came to us and said, well, I have a sudden and severe problem. You've got to give me some money for my schools. And I said, you've been three years without it. 
What makes this year different? So we went to court, went all the way up to the First Circuit, and we won. Because they were being over-taxing their people. Two new problems are coming up, is if you're close to a, uh, an urban area and you have public water, public sewer, same problem. They're paying the majority of the water, the majority of the sewer. Well, people will say, well, they're using the majority. Well, not quite. Some systems, they're using 60% of the water, but paying 90% of the cost. So what we have done in Maine, and this is the real big reason I say we're anti-business. We're anti-business because when we see a business, we think they all have real deep pockets, and then we tax them, or we fee them to death. But if that doesn't work, then we regulate them. And then what that happens is they get to a point where they say enough is enough, and they leave. So I've talked a little bit about the taxes and the energy. Let me talk about the minimum wage, the $12 in November. I asked the legislature to do a competing measure. Everybody said, no, no, we deserve $12. Okay, that's fine. You want to pay $12, you pay $12. Let me tell you what the minimum wage is in certain states. Let me take, take one that I know are very good. Texas, $7.25 an hour. No income tax, fastest growing state in America. Their per capita income is about 15,000 higher than ours. New Hampshire, they're 12,000 above us. Connecticut is about 20,000 above us. Massachusetts is about 15,000 above us. So, it's not about the minimum wage. It really isn't. It's about a living wage. A minimum wage should be a starter wage. A living wage is companies that pay sixty to ninety thousand dollars a year or a hundred thousand a year. Those jobs are what we're losing. We're losing the sixty thousand dollar jobs and we're getting the ten dollar an hour job. That's because we're anti-business. You know, the average in, uh, income tax per state in America is 5.5%. The average income tax for rural states, for all the rural states, is 5.16%. We have six New England states, and the average for New England, with one state having zero, is 6.6. .6. Is that telling us something? It should. It really should. It's telling us that we don't want the jobs. And now we're going to go after you some more with the minimum wage. Let me tell you the impact of the minimum wage. Between the ages of 16 and 25, the per capita income in Maine is $25,000. From 25 to 65, it's somewhere as over $60,000, the average per capita. 65 and above, $35,000. Now this is what's important. Minimum wage goes up to $10. People from 16 to 25, or maybe maybe less than that, 16 to 20, 22, are going to most likely get less of the jobs because they have no experience. So that unemployment rate is going to go up. So they're not going to make, they might be making $10 an hour if they can get a job, but fewer people can get a job. But this is where the big danger is, 65 and over. Anybody on Social Security or fixed income does not get a raise. They get nothing except higher food prices. If you're paying four and a half dollars for a gallon of milk, you're going to pay five. If you're paying three fifty for a loaf of bread, you're going to pay four. You can say he's full of baloney. That's fine. One lady told me I was full of baloney. She said, "No, you don't." And one reporter's right here who heard. 
So I said, well, if minimum wage goes up to $10 an hour, when you go to Dunkin' Donuts to, with your friends once a week to have a coffee and a donut, it's going to go up. And she said, no, it's not. All they got to do is sell more coffee. <laughs> That's not the way it works. I would love it to work that way. We just sell more, just work harder. Like buying an apple for a dime, selling it for a nickel, and making it up in volume. <laughs> That's not how our economy works. <laughs> and let me tell you what happens. Good people talk with their feet. Despite what you will hear by liberals, 25 years ago, Maine and New Hampshire had about the same number of millionaires. Now, they have three times the number, and we're down under 500. They're up around 5,000. We used to be about 2,400, 2,500 each. That's what happens. I know a lot of people in New Hampshire who haven't moved very far away because they love Maine, they love this, this region of the country. But they live in New Hampshire because there's no income tax and no sales tax. I was looking the other day about where most of the EBT money is spent in this country. And I said there are five top states that are not close by, but New Hampshire is number six. You know our EBT cards, the majority of the money gets spent in Bronx, Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Kiss to be Florida or Disney World in Las Vegas. Now, I will say this. I understand Disney World, and I do understand Las Vegas. But who would ever go on vacation in the Bronx, Brooklyn, or Philadelphia? <laughs> and people in Augusta ignore it, don't want to do it. I was meeting today with a a leader of the Democratic Party. And this is the conversation, you know, for five years. For five years being governor of the state of Maine, I have fought for welfare reform. And out of the blue, this year, you guys agreed with me and you passed everything I've asked for. And I said, do you have any reason why? Do you know why that happened? And she said, yes. I said, would you mind sharing it? Because the polls say the people want it. That's exactly the answer. The people demanded it. So make no bones about it, folks. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you tell your elected officials what you expect, they will deliver. Now, the minimum wage, I'll be the first one to tell you I think $10 is an appropriate amount right now. And I think that we can increase it until we get to $12, but we cannot absorb $12 all at once because people aren't wealthy enough. With a per capita income of under $40,000, 45,000 companies in the state of Maine with only 200 of them with 100 or more people can't afford it. That most of our companies are family-owned companies smaller family-owned companies. And what's going to happen with a $12 minimum wage is that the owners are going to have to work harder for less and somebody's going to lose a job. That's what's going to happen. If you look at what happens after every time we increase the minimum wage, we have a recession. This is going to be the largest ever. And the largest population in Maine <coughs> The largest constituent in Maine is on fixed income. Either disabilities, mental health or intellectual disabilities, and retirement. You don't know how many people, I mean, the mother and father are in their late 60s, my age, and they have a 39-year-old person with autism. They're worried about when they pass, who's going to take care of their son? 
And now they're faced with all three of them on fixed income. They're going to face a major increase in food prices in all other services. So I beg you all to tell your legislators that we'll defeat minimum wage in November, but you've got to fix it in January. Because it needs to be fixed. I don't deny that. It just needs to be appropriate for what we can afford. And then the other one. Many in this room have lived the same, I'm sure the same as I have here in Maine. As a child, you say, keep your nose clean, work hard, study, and you'll make it, you'll be successful. I will tell you, I am probably the person in Maine who has lived the American dream. I started out on the streets modest, I mean, I'm no Donald Trump. He's got tens of billions of dollars. But I've made it okay in Maine. I've been able to give my, my family a good living. They've all gone to college. Everybody's doing well. And I have not had to ask the state to help me. That's a blessing. But now, in November, we're saying that if you're successful and you make over $200,000 as a family, we're going to tack another 3% onto you. A surcharge. Unnecessary. Totally unnecessary. We passed the budget last year. I had one 5.75% income tax. It got defeated. They added $300 million to it. Folks, I'm not lying when I tell you I can't spend the money fast enough. We have more money in our budget than we can spend. But they're all screaming for a supplemental budget. So let me tell you what a supplemental budget is. This is how you'll get the meaning of what happens when, when you get on this, this spend, spend, spend. It's like an addiction. I look at spending like heroin. Once you're on, you can't get off. A supplemental budget in Maine started when we, when we were in a recession and every year we were in the red. When I first became governor, we were getting two supplementals a year because Medicaid was killing us. We were 250 to 300 million in the red every six months. Now we haven't had uh, red ink for, since I've been your governor, frankly, because once we get it under control, we don't need supplementals. So now they're all hollering at me for not having a supplemental. Supplemental simply means we want to spend. There's no reason to spend right now. We're black everywhere. Revenues are up. Expenses are down. When I became governor, uh, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, the current budget that we're operating under has got 13,000 500 positions in the state. Every two weeks, red payroll, and I keep track of it, we're under 11,000 paychecks every two weeks. Not much under. My goal was to be at 9,500. I don't think I'm going to make it because they keep putting more people in. But at the end of the year, at the end of the year, June 30th of every year, they come in and we have this big surplus. And if they would have let the money, the surplus money go to the rainy day fund since I've been your governor, we would now have achieved a triple A rating. We would have our triple A rating because they said $300 million. And so far since I've been your governor, I'm just short of $500 million surpluses. But it's all gone. Because what they do, they have a thing called cascade. Cascade means this is the budget, but if there's money left at the end of the year, we're going to spend it here, 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 and here. So on June 30th, you get a surplus. On July 1st, by dinner time, no more money. Gone. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. But this is the, the battle that I have. It's fiscal responsibility, prudent taxation, and not be anti-business. Anti-business. Drives people away.
away. Now I'll ask you, just before the first question, let me ask you this. How many in this room know someone who leaves for six months in a day? You know what that means, six months in a day? That means you don't have to pay tax in Maine. And we drive them to it. We drive them to it. It's unfortunate because many people tell me, I'd love to be in Maine, but you're being unreasonable. And it's particularly about the debt tax. That's the one that most people are concerned about. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Governor. Our first question comes from Mark Hager. Where are you? I'd just like to ask, given Damascata, uh, because of the tax exempt properties we have, approximately 15% of all the properties in Damascata are tax exempt. And it's growing all the time. And there's no help. We are a service center. Um, it just seems like it's uh, out of control. It's out of control, and I agree with you. In Waterville, I was mayor of Waterville for, for eight years. If you think it's bad in Damascara, listen to this. Waterville is 12 square miles, 6 by 2. 12 square miles. It has three hospitals, two colleges. It has 107 nonprofits and 29 churches. Over 40% of the land base is non taxable. Now, when I left, I had reduced the taxes by 20%. We put $10 million in the bank. It can be done. This is the problem with Maine. Every one of us, and I, the most criticism I've taken, or some of them, for the most, I'd say not the most, but one of the most hardest topics that I take criticism on is lands for Maine's future. Lands for Maine's future is when a, the land trust will come into your town and say, we want that land into conservation for, the, for into perpetuity. You say, oh, wonderful, it's for the public use, we're going to love it. Oh, but well, we're going to take it off the tax rolls, and then we're going to go see the governor and say, you sell some bonds so we can buy this land. Then that means you're paying for the bonds, and you lose your tax base. I have tried to put up bills that would say, if you want to put land in conservation, by all means, Go for it. I'm all in. But you've got to continue paying your taxes. And I mean, no bones about it. Democrats don't even let it get life. I put that in. It never goes. First of all, I'm lucky if they will let it go to committee. And if it goes to committee, it never comes out. I've been saying that now for three years. You cannot ask. You cannot continually spend at the local level or cause yourself headaches and then come to the states that give us more money. I am all in on education. I think we're spending way too much on education, for instance. $3.4 billion out of $7.4 billion budget. It's a lot. But I will tell you this, we overspend in all the wrong places and we don't put enough money in the classroom. If we had a one state teacher's contract, every teacher would have parity across the state. And so not only the rich towns and cities would have all the best teachers. They're not best teachers because they teach them better. They're best teachers because they're willing to pay them money and people are willing to move for more money. So I agree with you. Uh, one of the big things that the communities in Maine have to look out for is not consolidation as much as regionalization. I think the road should be county level. I think, uh, I think education, for that matter, the administration of our education there's no need to have seven or eight districts in one county. 
You can do payroll one place. We do payroll every two weeks for 11,000 people. It takes no time at all. So there's some things we could do to lower the cost. Now, now what about the Dan Scott of being carrying the whole load for all these towns around us? Where we're designated service center. I mean, that's what we were convinced to be. And the state recognizes this as a service center, but yet it's you know, kind of on your own. Now we have. Okay, I, know. A, I know. I know what you're saying. Wrong. It's, it's like living in Waterville where you're 29 mills and you live in Vassabor, you're 13 mills. Or you live in Belgrade, it's 13 mills. Or if you're on the back narrows of Booth Bay, you're 8 mills. <laughs> <laughs> The problem, though, is you pay three times what you pay for your house to pass. <laughs> Next question from Patty Bradley. Where are you, Patty? Yes. Your point is very good because a service center should be a district. Thanks. Meet me over here. You're from Bristol? are earning minimum wage make ends meet without assistance either by accessing food banks, SNAP, or other government programs? Okay. I will tell you, if you're 16, 17 years old, you make a minimum wage, uh, that's a beginner wage. If you're 40 years old making a minimum wage, then you need to go to your local education system and we've got to work on getting you higher skills because it's a skill gap. It's not Nobody wants to pay minimum wage, but they pay what they can afford to pay. Now, anybody on minimum wage qualifies and should get services. No question about it. And I'm all in for people who are able-bodied people who are working and can't make ends meet, they should get services. But if you're an able-bodied person and you're on services and you're not working, I have a problem with that. We have the career centers as well. There we have well. 26 career centers. We have anyone and everyone. Well, just one other thing, which I think needs clarification, is the referendum would not raise the minimum wage till 2020 to $12. Well, so, <laughs> except if it's incremental. So therefore, we're not jumping from the current minimum wage right to $12. So it gives four years for this to be to be put in. Okay, but you take the tip credit immediately. But I mean, I'm just saying that... Okay, now, what she's saying is, she's saying it's spread over some time. Four years. It's going to be 2020. You know, it's going to be three years. Well, okay. So 17, 18, 19, 20, however you divide it. Yeah. It goes to 9 and 17, 10, 11. Right. And we can't absorb that in this economy is what I'm trying to say. We can't absorb it that high. I'll give you an example. People think, let's say a company has a thousand employees. And everybody thinks that you're the only ones that get the increase, the people at minimum wage. And they're going to go up to say $9. But if you're making $9 today, you don't expect to stay there, or do you? I run companies. If it's $7.50 now, they're making $9, they're expecting to make $10.50 when the minimum wage was up. It's just the way people look at it. They don't want to stay at minimum wage if they're already above it. They expect to be making more. That's what you all forget about. Give you an idea of what, if you've got a company, the last company I was with, 2 million hours a year. 2 million hours of work a year. That's how many hours of people will be paid to work in a year. Two million hours. Do you know what a quarter does to that? A quarter on two million hours is five hundred thousand dollars. It doesn't take a lot to put you out of business. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, the other thing: the average waiter and waitress in the state of Maine is over eighteen dollars. You take the tip credit away and you give them minimum wage. Good luck finding help. Good luck to you. That's 
just reality. Now, in the summer months, my proposal was let's lower the income tax. There's only 803,000 people paid. No, I'm sorry. It's 803,000 people working in Maine. There's only 653,000 that pay income tax. 653,000 people pay income tax. Between May 31st and Labor Day, we have 40 million people visiting Maine. Add a percent on to the sales tax, those people will never complain because we're still below the national average on the sales tax, but we're above average on the income tax. So we're just priorities. We're not looking at where we make the money. I was looking at a graph yesterday. We, we pay sales tax on goods, and the goods have gone like this, and services have gone like this, but we don't tax services. So we, we, are, we set our priorities based on what union mentality wants us to. Because the unions know, if you're making $10 an hour and you go, to, and you go from $7.50 to $9, then every member is going to go to $10.50. And I defy any company that says, we're not going to give you, you're making $9 and it goes up to $9, you're going to keep them there. You're going to lose employees. I'll tell you why you're going to lose employees. Because in Maine, right now, we're in employment at 3.6%, 3.5%, and we have 15,000 jobs going unfilled. So you're forcing, the market is forcing. You don't need people forcing it artificially by the minimum wage. You don't need it. The market will take care of it. I don't know of anybody in my former employer that works for less than, I think it's $9, is the starting wage. So this whole minimum wage is a very scary thing. You've got to understand what it does to the economy. What's the economics of raising? What's one penny increase in minimum wage costing your economy? Next question, Don Gilbert. Good reason is it the energy. Here we've got here all these paper mills are all closing in Maine, and we have people without jobs. They are still workers. I don't understand it. Okay, let me try to help you understand what's going on. Airbus, you've all heard of Airbus. Airbus, I caught, I spoke. It's not paper, but it's the same exact thing that's happening with paper. I spoke to Airbus. And we said, why don't you come to Brunswick, Maine? We have an air station we just inherited. We have all these, uh, this equipment. We've got runways. We have, we get storage for planes, equipment. I mean, it's a huge facility. If you come to Maine, they figured it would cost a $250 million investment. They decided to go uh, to uh, Alabama for $600 million. And what he told me was this. What you don't understand, Governor, is that 14 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, it will take us a dozen years to make our money back. At 4 cents, which is what we're guaranteed in Alabama, we make it back in five years. Because they're one-third cheaper. The other thing is, both Arkansas and Alabama are right to work states. That's another big issue. So, and the other thing is eucalyptus is one of the species that they use for making paper. Grows to maturity in about 17 years. In Maine, spruce takes 50 or 60. So that's another reason. Madison paper, right now, the highest cost of pulpwood in America is in Maine. And I'll tell you why, it's very simple. In Maine, we have we the largest forest in America, in Maine. 90% of Maine is a forest. However, we have a thing called tree growth. Tree growth means you put your land into tree growth and you get 90% tax break. We talked about tax breaks earlier. You get 90% tax break. But what you've got to do is you've got to hire a forester and you've got to write a plan, a management plan. The management plan means 
that you will cut some of your wood and sell it to the paper mills. Well, out of the 17 million acres we have in tree growth, only 10 million are cutting the wood. The other 7 million along the coast and in the urban areas down south and aren't cutting the wood. So they're getting the tax break and they're not cutting the trees for the paper companies. The paper companies have to depend on the other 10 million acres and voila, we have the highest cost in America. Because you have Madawaska, Woodlands, and Sappy all going after the same wood. And Sappy is a big user, they're a big mill. And you got Verso and Catalyst, who I'm meeting with, uh, I think it's Friday. Uh, I've been meeting with the mills, and uh, they're going to be in on Friday. And they're, they're saying the same thing, wood cost. Some companies buy wood as far as Nova Scotia and Michigan because they can't get it in Maine. Because it's not a matter of that, that we have a shortage of wood, is we have a shortage of people cutting wood. There's a difference. And the newspapers all say, oh, I say these bad things about paper companies. I'm on their side. I want to tell you something. I'm on, I come from the paper industry. I understand what's going on. And the problem is, it's the legislature. It is nobody's fault but the legislature. If the legislature said, you got a deal, you cut your wood. If you don't cut your wood, you pay the full tax. The problem would be going away overnight. So that's some of the reasons. Where's Eric Carlson? You had a question about tree growth. Did the governor answer that for you? Are you satisfied with that? Or do you want clarification on the tree growth program? Um, maybe. Hold on. <laughs> I did not know that about the eucalyptus. That's why when I was in the paper industry, we had 400,000 acres of land in Brazil because they can grow trees in eight years. Hi, I'm uh, actually a licensed forester and I've been in the logging business now for close to 25 years. And uh, uh, I've been involved with the Healthy Forest Initiative too, sitting on the working groups, trying to engage landowners in the coastal zone in southern Maine to harvest their timber because in southern regions are growing more than the harvesting north is the opposite. That's correct. So that being said, the, and I don't know the exact figure, but it's in the 50s where roughly 50% say of the wood that is marketed in Maine comes off land that's in tree growth. So the legislation that was just introduced a couple weeks ago to remove potentially any land and tree growth within 10 miles of the coast seem just uh, going in the opposite direction of what we're trying to, um, you know, make happen here. Well, so, it, it, I will agree with you that it's going in the wrong direction, but there's a message there. They're not cutting. They're not the ones that, I'll tell you, if you go down from, you start from Kittery and you get up to Belfast, there's less of that 10 mile radius that's being cut than from Belfast up to Cowes. That's the point. And you're absolutely right. The majority of the work in North, Northern Maine, or the second tier, second district, we call it CD2, we're overcutting. And CD1, we're undercutting. And then you could get into species issues. That despite the fact that we're 50-50 software hardware, in general, Southern Maine has all the pine, which makes it a much more complex issue because they have less of the hardware than the north. There's a belt that goes across that has more of the hardware. So the point is, if you're not, the, the whole message of that bill was, if you're not going to cut it, then don't allow it. That's all. If you're going to cut it with but if you're going to put it in and not cut it, why should you get the, the, the benefit? And that, that's already a requirement of the program, so it would seem it would just need to be enforced, because that's already a requirement of, of pre -throw. And why isn't the legislature requiring enforcement? Do you realize that it, there's nobody that has the authority to enforce pre -throw? As I sit here right now, the force department doesn't, and the MRS doesn't. The only one that has is the town. 
and the town isn't pushing it, so it isn't happening. And now you're trying to say, look, either take it away or enforce it. I agree with you, 100%. Enforce it, we have no problem. But we're not enforcing it. And guess why we're not enforcing it? Where do you think all the votes come from in Maine? South. The population's in the south. That's where the numbers are. And I will tell you right now, you're going to hear more about it this summer. The worst company, the worst organization in the state of Maine is the Natural Resource Council of Maine. And I'll tell you why. They're against mining. They're against sawmills. They're against biomass. They're against paper making. They're against any manufacturing company in the state of Maine. We had an opportunity to have mining in northern Maine mining in Aroostook County where unemployment, unemployment is in double digits. Washington County, unemployment is in double digits. And they said no. Where did all the votes come from? Portland and York. Because that's where all the money is that supports it. I am telling you, they rejected having good jobs in northern Maine because they don't want mining in Maine. Now let me explain to you what I, how I feel about that. The most important asset on the planet, the most important asset on the face of this earth is human life. If you don't pay any attention to your environment and you just go for good high paying jobs, you have an environmental catastrophe. On the other hand, if you only pay attention to the environment and you don't allow human life and human activity to develop good paying jobs, you have extreme poverty. We have got extreme poverty in Aroostook County, Washington County, Northern Somerset County, Piscataquis County, and Northern Penobscot County. And every time I talk to companies that we can attract, the socialists in Augusta, and I can't help but call them socialists because they all support Bernie, <laughs> say no. no. Now, in order to be successful in Maine, we have to find balance. A balance between being a good steward to our oceans, our forests, our lakes, our rivers, and but we have to be able to find good jobs. If we just go out of balance, we either going to have an environmental catastrophe or poverty. We in Maine have chosen poverty. And I am trying to fight that. That's my only issue in Augusta, is I think we need better jobs. Okay. Next question, Emily Elliott. You and your policies have got, as governor have supported younger people and their contribution to our state. And how do you hope to keep them here? Okay. I'll pay you the $20 later. <laughs> because we just passed a bill that I have been working on for three years. That every student that goes to college in the state of Maine will get interest-free loans from the state. And once they graduate from college, if their employer pays it off, the employer gets the tax benefit, and the employee can put his money into buying houses, cars, and everything else. They can, instead of having draconian, and I call it draconian loans, we are going to help them pay it off so they can contribute to society quicker. Not only are we going to do it for main kids on paying the loans back, but any young couple in America that wants to come and grow their family you know, bring up their family in Maine, which I believe is still the safest state in America. We are the safest state in America. I believe personally, this is an opinion, that we are the most beautiful state in America. I think we have four seasons. We have the mountains, we have the ocean, we have the lakes, we have the rivers, we have great hunting and fishing, and we have the four seasons. So I do believe that this is one way of doing it. The other thing that will help, and I need, and I can't do it without a legislator, <coughs> is having regulations and tax laws that are not anti-business. 
they got to be pro-business. And you can have pro-business, good jobs, and a great environment. And I will tell you right now, Maine has 17 million acres of forest land. We have got the highest acreage of certified green forest in America. Right here in Maine. We have the only sustainable fisheries in the world, right here in Maine. So we are, we are very sensitive to our environment. We have the lowest emissions created here in Maine. Our energy portfolio is the highest percentage of renewable energy right here in Maine. It's about 64, 65%. So we are doing that. The problem is, you need people that will create jobs, so you can interest the young people to take jobs. And this is the this is what we're like. Investment capital goes where it's welcome and stays where it's appreciated. And when you're not appreciated, you boogie, you leave. And that's the problem. And until and until main people elect people to go to Augusta that are willing to fight for a balance of a good environment and good job until you find that balance, we're going to be lopsided one way in this environment. Governor, we have some young people here tonight. Come over here. And uh, this young lady, Kate, she gave me a question just a few minutes ago, so I want to give her an opportunity. Sure. Uh, regarding your proposal to raise the property tax, I was just wondering uh, your ideas on how raising the property uh, tax would affect those with fixed incomes. Okay. First of all, I don't have a policy to raise property taxes because it's illegal for the government to raise property taxes. Property taxes, it's a local tax, it's a local control state. All property taxes are raised at the local level. I was a mayor for eight years. I got, when I became mayor of Waterville, our mill rate was 29 mills. I left, it was 21 mills. I had $10 million in the bank. All our bills paid for. That's what good governance does. I don't know who told you that I want to raise property taxes, but they're dead wrong. Okay? Joe Bates? Thank you. Governor, I would just like to compliment you on the job you're doing. I am a self-employed lobsterman, an upper commission vessel lobster officer out of the town of Rockland, and I would, I have been very, very uh, closely following politics for years, and I would encourage you to stay true to your core principles and continue to run the state like you've been running. Thank you, sir. It's been three years working for it, working to fix it, and every year 
the Democrats vote us down. It's very simple. What has happened in Maine is under the previous administration, they put in uh, consolidation of jails and consolidation of schools. And what they did, frankly, uh, was a massive failure in both counties. What they have done is the state said, we're going to control the prison beds, but you, 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 you control the cost initially. And then they said, well, we're going to cap it. So they cap how much communities can pay for the jails. And so then they came in and the jails were running out of money. And rightly so. Because of, for the same reason you just expressed, a, your, the jail in, uh, in this region, and there's one in, uh, in uh, Sunset County, same thing, new jails. And they built them bigger than they needed because they thought they could make some money with prisoners. It turns out the state took over. The problem now is this. The jails have the problem of spending, and the state has the problem of not funding. And we have tried, and all I say is this. Whoever has the checkbook should be in charge of the spending. Not, the, not somebody who has no checkbook and have somebody else pay for the spending. In other words, it's like, my wife gets my paycheck, she gives me an allowance. If I don't get an allowance, I get no money. And I can't have no money, I can't spend. And the problem is, you can't say the state's in charge of the spending, I mean the, the paying of the bills, but the counties are in charge of the spending. So there's, there's never going to be enough money for the jails because the way we set it up. It's the same thing with our schools. I learned a long time ago, well before I became governor, there's never going to be enough money for schools. And there will never be enough money that I won't, I just know, there's no amount of your money that I won't spend on my health care. So you've got to have a balance. You can't tell the state, you pay for the jails, and then you have no limits on what can be spent, and then you can't charge the counties. So the problem is a problem, structural problem that was changed back in about 2009. We have been fighting to change it, but it's a division in the legislature about who should pay? The Democrats believe the, the state should pay, and I don't have a problem with that. But if the state's going to pay, they should take over the jails. You can't, you can't tell somebody, you're going to pay, but somebody else makes the decisions about the jail. Now, if, if the counties don't want the state to take over the jails, I'm fine with that too. But you're going to take care of funding it. You can't ask one to pay and the other one to spend. Whoever's got the checkbook has got to be in charge of the spend. That's the problem. Well, Governor, we've gone past our time. What about what solar? What about solar? We no, answered the solar question. Why are you allowed to be back in the country? Why are you going to be back in the country? We've already actually asked you what we need to know. The Governor okay. answered the solar question earlier. You're in the news right now. Everybody okay. solar. Please move. Not listening to experts on drug abuse. Why? Because he's not. James, we're going to ask you to leave. He's disrupting. No, he's not. He's not. He's not. He's not. Yeah. Yeah. Every single week, sir, and you ask the same questions, and I try to be reasonable, and you are unreasonable. I, Good night, sir. I Good night. 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 Everybody, thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate you being respectful and civil throughout the evening. And unfortunately, we encounter this type of behavior every once in a while. But again, we appreciate your civility, your respect for the governor, and we were happy to have that open dialogue with you. If you want to have a dialogue about Narca, be more than happy to talk to you about it. You want to know about solar, be more than happy to talk to you about it. Solar is a great thing, and it's going to be great when we find a way to, to put it in the battery and save it. Until then, you need two systems. And I, I don't care about solar at all. If you want solar, please do it, but don't ask me to pay for it. Don't ask me to pay for your solar. That's all I'm asking. Narcan, 
Narcan's a good drug. And if you took it once and you learned from it, fine. But after 12 times, I think we ought to charge you. We have some people that have had 12, 14, 16 shots of Narcan. There comes a point in time where who's responsible for who? You know, a shot of Narcan is $70 and the person who gets it doesn't have to pay it back. I think the first time, second time, third time even, I don't mind them not paying back because it's very difficult to get off addiction. But after a dozen times, I think it's time that we make a new arrangement. And what was the other issue? The other issue was that. He's always got, I forget, I see that so much I pay attention to it. But we are about four past now. Yeah. In all due respect, I am not here to argue or fight with people. That's not my job. And, that's, and I don't care to do it. What I do care to do is to tell you how I govern, why I do what I do, and I'm willing to answer your questions to the best of my ability. I'm not asking you or asking anybody to agree. My opinions are my opinion, your opinions are your opinions. We all have opinions. What we're not entitled to do is make up our own facts. Now, I read something today from a, a gentleman, I don't forget his name, but he says I, might, I want to kill people and I, I, I don't know what he means, but I know one thing, that if you're on addict, you're addicted to heroin and people are trying to help you and you don't want their help, what do you do next? Because I have parents that ask me that all the time. What are you going to do? My daughter is addicted. My son is addicted. I've spent $50,000, but they're not ready to get treated. And my answer is, I don't know what to do. I simply don't know. Now, we just passed a bill. We're going to put 200 beds in a regional prison down in Wyndham. We're going to have 200 treatment beds. They're going to be for people with addictions, we're going to have an inpatient, outpatient. I've been working on that for four years, despite the fact that nobody ever wants to report on it. The fact that we've just, the first of its kind, in Maine, we're going to be able to have a, a uh, hospital environment for women prisoners. We're going to have people with mental illness are going to be in this, and get treatment, not just incarceration. Geriatrics in the prison, if you have someone in your family that's spending life in prison, and they're getting old, they're going to be taken care of. In the past, they go in and out of the hospital. We're not trying to do that. Addiction, I am very serious about addiction. I'm working with a judge in, in uh, Miami, and we're working with the state of North, uh, South Dakota. They have programs, we're trying to instill them into our prison, but it's so political. It, you, what you read in the newspapers, folks, is not what's happening. Like I've said to many, many of my friends, the newspapers have made so bad, you can't even trust the obituaries. <laughs> now, my whole purpose is to tell you why I do what I do. I'm, I'm taking suggestions, and many of the good ideas that happened in, in Augusta, many of the things that have changed in Augusta, happen on Saturday morning from the people of the state of Maine who come in and tell me a fisherman will come in and say, we should be doing this. Let me tell you one bill that came from a lot of fishermen. When I was your governor, back in 2011, it was illegal for a lobsterman to put a lobster trap on a dock. Lobsterman came in, talked to me, we changed it. Now, they, you go by, they can put traps on docks. That's good. So that's what we try to do. Am I going to please everybody? No. Do I want to see an addict die? No. If I, if I did, I wouldn't be working so hard to try to keep him alive. But let me tell you one disappointing thing this year. In Maine, you need to be arrested three times with heroin in your body before we will arrest you for a felony. So we give you three times to kill yourself instead of trying to stop them on the first time. I think once we catch them, we give them a choice. Go to jail or go to rehab. 
But what the state legislature said is, no, we'll let you do it three times before we arrest you. We'll slap you on the hand. That's three times, that's three shots at killing yourself. <coughs> now, am I wrong in me trying to get it the first time? You can't convince me that rehab is better than taking heroin. I can't be convinced of that. I think the sooner you get the problem into treatment, the better. So, you know, this young man that was here, he's become my, what do you call him? My groupie. <laughs> Every time I go someplace, he shows up. And one of his friends used to come, but now he's mad because I made fun of Brittany at the Grateful Dead, because they had groupies. <laughs> and I did, it wasn't intended that way. It was intended to just be fair to everybody, let you know how I govern, why I govern it the way I do it. And, and I'm not expecting everybody to agree, but I am expecting that if you have a question, I should be able to listen as long as you respect me. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was joyful, and uh, we'll see you a lot in the summer since I'm a neighbor. Thank you.